the game in the cartridge slot. The Nintendo PlayStation is a real thing. It really exists. It was showcased at the 1991 Consumer Electronics Show right before Nintendo very publicly kicked Sony to the curb. As a result, there's only one working Nintendo PlayStation in the world. And last time it sold, it went for more than my house. So I don't think I'm going to be owning that one, but it did give me an idea. I was given half a PlayStation a few years ago. It spent the whole time in my toolbox with tools being thrown on it all the time. And I still have the Japanese SNES shell from my portable Super Nintendo video. So I just gotta sort of just, just put them together, right? And then it'll be a Nintendo PlayStation. I suspect this capacitor might be bad. Solder in the new one. Fix some broken solder joints I found. The only capacitor I had was too big and the wrong value, but I reckon it'll work. <laughs> There's a slight issue in that I don't have any way to put games in. But surprisingly, you can still get drives off the internet. They're pretty cheap and nasty though, definitely not made by Sony. And the disc touches the plastic. I really am happy that I now have ring scratches on my Moto Racer disc. I'm going to test this with a less important disc. <laughs> Do I need that plastic? No, oh, apparently I need that plastic. Why do new things all have to be junk? I appreciate that these are still being made, but it ruined my disc and it still doesn't work. Ow! Oh, that's still powered on. I've adjusted the spindle height. The disc isn't touching. If I push down the lid closed button now, <laughs> there we go. Now that it's working, it's time to rip its guts out. Don't need that. Don't need that. Now how am I gonna get this in here? There, there, I don't know, somewhere. Does it fit? Not quite. I think this should go this way. Oh, it's so close to fitting. There we go. That fits. So the power supply will fit up the back here, but I'm not gonna be able to plug anything into the power connector, so I'm gonna relocate that. Connect some wires between the parts. Now it'll fit here quite nicely. I don't like this bit of metal under here though, so I might get rid of that. Oh, awesome, a mod chip, region free. This is the expansion connector. The last of the PlayStations didn't have this anyway, so it really doesn't need it. Yeah, heaps of space. Now, obviously this power cable is not gonna reach the power supply anymore. I found this in my box of junk. It's pretty much completely the wrong thing. But if I cut off the first five pins, kind of jams in there and hopefully that works. This is the Super Nintendo power switch. This is what I wanna use. The PlayStation one's over here. We don't need that, so I'm gonna get rid of it. There we go. Ah, except this switch is actually two switches in one package. This one isn't, but that's okay. I have a solution. I'll make it so that this switch is always on. <laughs> Cut the mains trace over here, solder some wires across the gap, then connect them to the switch. In its past life, this switch never had to switch any more than nine volts, and I'm putting 240 volts through it. I'm I'm sure it'll be fine. I think I should probably put the controller ports in next. It'd be really nice if this spacing's the same. You know, it's not too far off, but I think it's too far off. I thought there was nothing on that piece of board. There was something on that piece of board, but it only took a few jumpers to fix it. Now, I suspect this is not going to fit well. It's so close to closing on there without cutting the case. I reckon that's good enough. Even got the gaps filled up. And once again, the cables aren't going to reach. But I just went looking and discovered that the cables I got to repair 3DO consoles have the same contact spacing. So if I cut this right here, it might peel. And that should work. Now it's gonna be a bit difficult to plug the AV cable in here. So I flipped the motherboard over and I've plugged in the AV cable. I'm using the continuity test feature on my multimeter to figure out which solder connections I need to use. And I've just found the last one. I found this RCA panel on the back of an old TV chassis. If I mount this on the back, I can use any generic RCA cables. I just need to wire this to those three points I found on the motherboard plus ground. While I'm on this side of the board, I need to attach some wires for the disc cover closed switch. I could make do without it, but then I wouldn't be able to change discs on multi-disc games, and I wouldn't want to compromise the quality of the console, would I? I think it's time for some hot glue. Well, most of that dribbled back out again, but it's sitting there well enough for now. Oh look, if I break this off, 
and put a screw in this, then only half the mains connector has to be held on with hot glue. There you go, you'd never know it wasn't factory. Installing the motherboard. Oh look, the AV ground even lines up with the motherboard ground. I can just pile a bunch of solder here for extra strength. This reset button's not gonna be very useful here. I wanna reuse the power light though, so I'm gonna just take that out gently. Now that I've got wires for the reset switch and the power light, I can put the power supply in. Except I don't want any chance of this high voltage in here touching this board. So I'm just gonna give it back its old home from the PlayStation. Hot glue, and a bit of the melty plastic trick, then a lot more hot glue. Hot glue, hot glue, hot glue, hot glue, hot glue, hot glue, hot glue. Because of the memory card slots, there isn't enough room under there for a power light. But I think if I take a bit of this plastic off and sit the power light the other way, it might just fit. I've marked where I think it should go, and some hot glue will hold it in place. I found this scrap PCB with some tactile switches on it. I'm gonna try and use these to make the disc cover open switch and the reset switch work. This plastic part used to reach all the way through to the motherboard of the Super Nintendo where the reset button was. It's not going to work for this though. I'm hoping I can just hot glue a tactile switch in here, then cut off this shaft bit by bit until it presses that button and pops back up again. And there we go, it works. I'm gonna use eject for the disc tray open button. It seems fitting. The idea's the same, but I'm gonna have to take off a lot more plastic. That's not a straight cut. It's not too bad. It's a little bit low on this side, but if I drop that side down as well, it'll be okay. Except there's a slight problem. I'm pretty sure if I connect the wires from the old lid switch to the eject button, I'm going to have to hold this down the entire time the disc's in. I don't want to do that. So it's time to plug it in. I need it turned on so I can make some measurements and figure out a way around that. Yeah, had me worried for a bit because it took a little while to turn on. There are two main logic voltages which most digital stuff like this seems to use. They're 3.3 volts and 5 volts. Older stuff always uses 5 volts, newer stuff tends to use 3.3. I'm fairly sure the PlayStation uses 3.3 volt logic and there's no 5 volts anywhere in here. These are the two wires that I connected to the back of the motherboard for the lid open switch. If I measure voltage across them, I can see that it's 3.5 volts. It's a tiny bit higher, but that's 3.3 basically. The other thing I need to find is a 3.3 volt power rail. The 3.3 volts coming out of those wires is just a signal, that's not what I need. To find the 3.3 volt rail, I need a ground first, which is easy to find because it's the traces that go to the case screws. Nothing else should ever be connected to case screws. Once I've grounded my black probe, I'm looking at these big thick traces here. I wanna measure each of those until I find the one that's the voltage I'm looking for, and that's it there. So one of the chips in the PlayStation somewhere is sending out that 3.3 volt signal to the switch. When the switch closes, the signal gets connected to ground, and the chip sending it out all of a sudden loses that signal and says, wow, okay, that lid must be closed. But I want my eject button to do the opposite of that. So I'm using a resistor to pull the signal down to ground, then 3.3 volts to pull it back up again when the button's pressed. The reset button is easy, it just connects straight on, except soldering to the button melted the hot glue and I had to go chasing the button around. But where am I gonna put the disk drive? Well, I think right about here is gonna be good. How good is hot glue? It really works for just about everything, except for the things that it doesn't. Need to make some holes for the wiring. But once again, the wiring is way too short. These two need to reach to these two connectors hidden under here. I didn't find any helpful connectors for this one, but I found some solid core wire which pushes into there quite nicely. I'll just solder the other end to the motherboard. I'll stop the wires falling out with some hot glue. This one's gonna be harder to extend though. I'm gonna try and use the rest of that 3DO ribbon cable. I need to attach this onto here. Hopefully I can scrape off some of this plastic so I can solder it together. For this, I'm definitely using flux. It'll help the solder flow onto the metal. Whoa, the plastic's melting from the soldering iron. I'm actually kind of amazed by how easily this is soldering. I kind of expected the whole ribbon to disintegrate. I'm gonna leave this tape wrapped around here. It's called Captain Tape. It's heat resistant and insulating. Having this ribbon cable so long and running straight over the top of the power supply has me kind of worried about interference, but it's too late now. Put the game in the cartridge slot. <laughs> when it gets to this, that means it's working. Oh, the controller's not working. I really should start checking consoles properly before I build things out of them. So it turns out there's actually a fuse for the controller ports. I even used one of its solder points for the eject button. You can buy these fuses, they're really cheap. You really shouldn't leave this unfused, but uh, I'm, I'm just gonna leave it unfused. <laughs> This is way better than the TI-83 Plus version. Now let's see if that mod chip works. Maybe we can do some proper gaming. Looking good. 
Oh, It's got no colour. Some versions of the original PlayStation need an additional mod to get colour on import games. Since I've already hot glued the motherboard in and stuck things all around it, I can't really get back to it to do that. Whoever put this mod chip in really just wanted to play burnt games from Australia. So I've downloaded a boot disc off the internet and hopefully that'll get us some colour. It lets me force the video mode. The video is all squashed down the bottom. It's because PAL has a different number of lines to NTSC. It's not very good driving. Oh, check. Uh, the controls are backwards. Where's the cool music gone? Don't we get that during the gameplay? Oh, I'm on a skateboard. You might have noticed that I haven't really played this before. I've owned it for a few years, and um, uh, something, something, now I'm playing it. That's a totally logical result for that. I've played Pepsi Man now. It's definitely Pepsi. With the help of an emulator, I can even play Nintendo games. Although, they're slightly glitchy, and I can't play Super Nintendo games. Apparently, the PlayStation is not powerful enough to emulate that. So now I own a Nintendo PlayStation. It's one of a kind. Anyone want to trade it for a house? I'm a pretty serious video game collector, and on Floatplane, I post a photo of every single video game thing I get. So if that sounds like something you'd like to see, it's only a dollar a month. The link's in the description. I'll see you there.